welcome to the Ghosts of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 50 of our chapter-by-chapter -chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we're discussing chapter 49 of A Game of Thrones. That's edit 14. As always, we'll chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we'll provide you with some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what's happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the TV show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some reader mail. Be sure to check out the show notes that come with this episode. They'll provide some additional information about the characters and other things. How are you, sir? I'm all right. We've done it. We made it. 50, 50 episodes. Well, we haven't done 50, it yet. 50, 50. We've started. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> this could all end horribly. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> So this is it. We wrap up shop now, right? We uh, close up shop. And... Yeah. yeah. I look at this book and we're still only like two thirds of the way through the first book of this series. <laughs> and there's what, like 72 chapters or so? I think so, yeah. So we've got... That'd be uh... exciting to move on to the second book. Yeah, it will be. Yeah. I'm all right, but I believe you might uh, be still in some um, temperature shock after your... Oh, uh, Yeah. So time I, in paradise. I, yeah, I had a week up in the mountains of North Carolina, and uh, it was quite. It was relatively cool up there. It was pretty warm still. I mean, there wasn't much sweatshirt wearing. It was. Uh, <laughs> it was plenty warm, but uh, back down here on the Piedmont, it was uh, roasting. I heard. And yes, si yes, it was. Since I've come back, I've discovered it was indeed roasting down here. So. Yeah. I think we hit 102 yesterday on my uh, car's thermometer. Lord. Yeah, so pretty yeah. brutal. But we had a yeah. we had a really nice time. We were up on a lake and uh, we we uh, did some water skiing and some wakeboarding and yeah, some crashing. You, I, I enjoyed the pictures you showed me. Uh huh. Did you see the picture of Lucas flying on the? Did I show you yes. that one? Yes. Yes, that's, that's that. Yeah, those are the ones you showed me. <laughs> I like that one. Um, and I took a good tumble. I took a tumble where I hit my face into the water very hard. And as I sort of recovered and the boat came back for me, I remember thinking, I might be bleeding. And from like way further away than I would have thought possible, the boat driver said, you're bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> way too far. Is <laughs> my whole face bleeding? <laughs> yeah. I'm gushing, apparently. <laughs> I hope there's no sharks in this water. Um, but well, it wasn't I, it wasn't as serious as it sounds. I was perfectly fine. All right, that's good. It's good to hear. We don't you don't want to smash up that face of yours. It's it's a right. money maker. That's <laughs> <laughs> why we do a podcast. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's why I'm still having second thoughts about this whole fiftieth uh, special with the uh, uh, video. True, yeah. <laughs> Terrible idea, for Kelly. Well, I uh, I too was on a uh, a boat on a lake this past weekend in. We, too, had a, a few uh, mishaps. So it, we were out there. We were having a good time. Started the storm. Like, we, we saw thunder in the distance. Or we didn't see thunder. We saw lightning in the distance. Heard the thunder. And we were like, okay, we better pack it up and head it back. So we get back to the to the launch, you know, where you take the boat out, put the boat in and all that. And um, my friend uh, Scott says to his wife, he, he said, all right, hop out. Go grab the... Uh, the truck bring the boat around and, and back the trailer into the water and she grumbles about it but she jumps out and goes doesn't and we're waiting in the the lake and i mean lightning is starting to like crash all around us the we the leaves are starting to blow we're like all right hurry it up so she gets there she spins the truck around and um just for life of her could not get that trailer straightened into the water she got it so jackknifed that she ran the back of the trailer into the back of the truck and put a huge dent in the bumper. So, oh no! So Scott pulls back onto shore and his son Ben hops out. And Ben doesn't even have a driver's license yet. He's like, "I'll fix it." And I was like, uh, "Do you want me to go with him in case this doesn't work out?" And he's like, "Yes, please." So Ben <laughs> tries. And he's not getting any better. So I hop in and give it a try. And let me tell you, trying to steer a trailer is a lot harder than it looks. But eventually, I do finally get the trailer into the water. And then the son calls out, Dad, okay, you could come in. Bring the boat in now. And, and the boat's just sitting out there. And he's like, Dad. And he's like, to me, he's like, why is he not listening? And you hear Scott shout out. 
the battery's dead. <laughs> so he's a hundred <laughs> yards out the lake. Oh, <laughs> the battery is dead. So, uh. so the son has to swim out, grab a rope, and swim it back to shore. Meanwhile, it is like Armageddon out there. There's like lightning thunder crashing everywhere the trees are swaying back and forth i was gonna ask actually if it was possible that the battery could get recharged by a bolt of lightning <laughs> it have, yeah, i think it might have <laughs> funnily enough actually i towed the i towed our boat back at one point our boat broke down and i tried towing it backwards because we were towing the um the floaty the the what do you call them the tube the tube yes i yes. we were so because that's coming out of the back of the boat, I thought it'd just be easier just to pull the tube. Um, uh-huh. That was very hard because the back of the boat is not very <laughs> <laughs> hydrodynamic. <laughs> and eventually we turned the, turned the boat around and I tried pulling it from the front. And that was a lot easier. But it, a lot was, easier, yeah. It was, it was good <laughs> exercise nonetheless, either way. <laughs> Take some doing. Uh, All right. It's well, time we get down we to business. We better get down to business yes. here. All right, so a recap of what Edward was up to last time we saw him. Um, he was slightly falsifying the last will and testament of his good friend, King Robert Baratheon. He was fending off approaches by Renly Baratheon and Peter Baelish to further co-opt the succession proceedings to their mutual benefit. He was paying Littlefinger to bribe the gold cloaks to his side and penning a letter to Stannis Baratheon congratulating him, him on becoming the new King of the S- Seven Kingdoms. Congratulations, Stannis Baratheon, first yes. in his name. McKelly, why don't we give him the summary of this chapter? Okay, let's do that. So Ned, passed out at his table, is woken by noise from the yard below. The Lannister men are hard at work training in the yard. Ned watches the Hound put a lance through a straw dummy and wonders if the show is on his behalf. He then wonders why Cersei and the kids still haven't fled. After breakfast with the girls, where he agrees to allow, before they sail north, Arya one last dance lesson with Sirio Forel, but denies Sansa a last goodbye with Prince Joffrey, he's met with news from Grand Maester Pycelle. The king is dead. Ned wants to weep, but duty calls and he must answer, so instead he asks Pycelle to convene the small council. When Littlefinger arrives, he tells Ned that the little task Ned sent him on is done, referring to him paying the gold cloaks to work on Ned's behalf against the Lannisters. After all but Renly have arrived, Ned learns that Renly won't be coming, as he, Sir Loras Tyrell, and 50 retainers left the city last night, heading south. Ned is disquieted by this news, but has no choice but to proceed with the meeting. Ned produces Robert's will and points out that Renly and Pycelle both witnessed it being sealed. Sir Barristan Selmy approves and then announces that the will reads that Eddard is to be protector of the realm until Robert's heir comes of age. Ned thinks that the heir is already of age as it's the king's brother Stannis. Ned then asks the council to confirm him as protector of the realm. But before they get any further, Fat Tom and the king's steward interrupt saying the king demands their presence immediately. Ned expected Cersei to strike quickly and puts up no argument. He limps his way to the throne room with the help of Littlefinger. He's encouraged by the sight of all the gold cloaks along the way, and there is also an overwhelming gold cloaks presence in the throne room. Joffrey sits the throne while his king's guard, his family, and 20 Lannister men surround its base. Joffrey announces that he wishes his coronation within two weeks and asks for pledges of fealty from the small council members. Ned has Robert's will given to Cersei. She reads it, scoffs, and tears it up. She then tells Ned that he recently gave her counsel and she repays it by suggesting he bend the knee and pledge his loyalty to their new king. If he does that, she will allow him to resign his hand to the king and return to Winterfell. Instead... Ned feels like she's forced his hand, and so announces that Joff has no claim to the Iron Throne. Stannis is the true heir. Things escalate quickly now, as she orders Sir Barristan Selmy to seize the traitor. However, Barristan is quickly surrounded by Stark guards. Ned then springs his surprise on the Lannisters. He asks Janus Slint to have the Gold Cloaks escort the Lannister family to the royal apartments, but do not harm them. Instead, the trap is sprung on Ned. A gold cloak runs Fat Tom through with his spear. Other gold cloaks and the hound do the same to the rest of the Stark men. 
During the ensuing chaos, Littlefinger slides Ned's dagger out and puts it under Ned's chin, saying, I did warn you not to trust me. I just, I read the line as it was written in there while you were reading it, puts it under his chin. (laughs) (laughs) Ned would be like, what's your point? Why are you putting a dagger under your chin? What are you going to do with that? (laughs) There's a scene in Blazing Saddles where the sheriff does that. Do you remember? Have you seen Blazing Saddles? (laughs) Yes. <laughs> ah, that's yes. good stuff. Well, Littlefinger did warn Ned very often not to trust him or anyone. So, Yeah. He he's, didn't want to prove a liar of himself by always right. being trustworthy. So this was his yeah. moment. Yeah. This is such a fitting chapter for our 50th episode. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, th- th- this... It feels like the explosion happened a couple of chapters ago. Maybe, maybe with Robert coming back half dead maybe that was the moment maybe yeah, the fuse when, the fuse we, was lit when <clears throat> ned told cersei yeah the bomb yeah. went off when robert was mortally wounded and now this is the beginning of the fallout of that you know this the, is the, the debris is coming the, down yes the beginning of the carnage here ned being uh, deceived and now it looks like he'll be taken prisoner or something it seems and so the time frame of this chapter is the morning after the previous ned chapter it it doesn't make it perfectly clear in there but at one point ned says the king called me to his side last night to record his final words so in case you were curious about the timeline it is the next morning so so what what chapter have we had in between it was a john chapter right it was john uh doing the vows yep okay I was, yeah. I, was, I was curious about that timeline, you know, that, that that happened the same day as all this. Oh, yeah, maybe. Basically. Maybe remember that I said uh, the wolf uh, ghost came back with a severed hand in his mouth, and I, and I made a uh, conjecture that could it have possibly been a symbol, a, a symbolism about Ned. It's a dire wolf with a severed hand. There you go. Dead hand in his mouth. So. There you go. Anyway. Yeah, I, I noticed something while I was reading this chapter is that a lot of Ned chapters start with him sleeping. Hmm. All the way back to the second Ned chapter, when they were in the Barrowlands, he was woken to take a ride with the king. Interesting. Then he, he the chapter, the one chapter started when he was fighting the, uh, he and his buddies were fighting the gold cloaks to get yeah. to Liana. Yeah. Then just the last Ned chapter, it started with him being in the crypts of Winterfell. Well, dreaming that he was in the crypts of Winterfell. And now this one, he was uh, sleeping at the beginning of it as well. That's four out of 14. That's, <laughs> that's quite a lot. It almost belongs in pedantry, in fact. That, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, presumably Ned sleeps pretty much every day. You would think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he might lose a little sleep now. Perhaps, yes, yes. Yeah, and the other thing you pointed out, and I think this is an interesting observation, is that he... Um, he seems to blow hot and cold on what he thinks Cersei will do. Simultaneously, he keeps thinking, oh, she'll flee King's Landing now. She'll flee King's Landing now. Now's her opportunity to flee. And at the same time, she thinks, he thinks, oh, she's going to strike. Oh, she's right. pl- flooding against me. It's like, well, one or the other, you know. You know what I think it is? I think Ned is a pessimistic optimist. I think that's what it is. He's preparing for the worst, but secretly hoping for the best. In the back of his mind. Could be that. Yeah. Yeah. He uh, he goes back and forth an awful lot. Yeah. So Sansa's confused why Arya still gets to do her dancing lessons. And we both wonder that Sansa still believes that story. Yeah. It it could only be the self-absorption of a 12-year-old girl. To not even like, not even register that that makes absolutely no sense that yeah. Ari will be taking dancing lessons. And, and maybe it's the fact that I think Ned has called them dancing lessons too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and as we've discovered, Ned is not big on telling fibs. What? Yeah, Ned? we have. So perhaps Sansa has come to trust him implicitly. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, but she's also she's confused because she gets to take. Arya gets to take the dancing lessons, but she's not allowed to go say goodbye to Joffrey. So this upsets her greatly. But of course, we know how bad an idea that would be if she did go uh, visit Joffrey that morning at breakfast. She, The way things turned out, she could have been used as a hostage, possibly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, she, of course, is not to know that. You know, she's a right. 12-year-old girl who wouldn't reckon, recognize the... 
geopolitical dangers of her uh, going to say goodbye to the boy she's in love with. Her prince. Her prince. Mm-hmm. So the small, the small council meets in the Tower of the Hand unusually, because they think that's safer than the council chamber. Littlefinger assures Ned that the task is done, um, referring to the bribing of the gold cloaks. And yeah. I, I think he was telling the truth. The task was done. The gold cloaks have been bribed. Right. <laughs> he, he was a little vague on that. Ned yeah. didn't call him on it. I and have used your done. money to bribe the gold cloaks <laughs> to do exactly what I want them to do. Yeah. yeah. That's this whole thing about him paying, about Littlefinger being the one handling this transaction is just so much trust being put in Littlefinger at face value for someone that Ned has already openly, at least his inner dialogue, mentioned that he doesn't fully trust. The truth of the matter is, though, if if Littlefinger was was always going to side with Cersei here, then, um, then even if Ned had gone to Janice Slint himself, it wouldn't have worked. Because he'd go to Janice Slint and say... I'll give you 6,000 golden dragons if you'll take my side in the forthcoming uh, contretemps in the throne room. Right. Littlefinger would have just been in there like, you can keep the 6,000, I'll give you another 6,000 to change sides. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I, and a little bit, when we, when we get to the right spot, yeah, I do want to talk a little bit about Littlefinger and his influence and why he's doing the things that he's doing. Yeah. But in the meantime, we get some big news in the uh, small council meeting. Renly has fled in the night, along with Loras Tyrell and uh, a bunch of sworn swords. Now, Ned Stark may be our nominal hero of the plot here, but Renly is just seeing things way more clearly. Because Renly yeah. is like, uh-oh, I'm out of here. I want yep. no part of this. It's going to go badly. Yeah, that's the thing. So we assume, we at least we don't have any knowledge of Renly knowing about the whole parentage of the prince uh, prince and princesses so him leaving so suddenly after ned turned down his offer he must have felt that the situation was just too dangerous for a true-born baratheon in king's landing at the moment so but 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 then but you say that but then without knowing about the lack of true-bornness of joffrey right yeah 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 exactly so it must be that he is clear he's he's significantly more familiar with the inner workings of court than Ned, and he realized bad things are brewing here. I better hightail it out of town. I, I wonder if, if some of it is that, we, we touched on this last time we talked about Renly, the animosity that he's always shown towards Joffrey and yeah. the, the casual sort of cruelty, not cruelty, but he just laughs in Joffrey's face about the type of person Joffrey is. He's not going to be held in high favor by Joffrey and Cersei, and so You're right, I, would, right. I wonder if it's as simple as that. It's just like I don't want to be around now. You know? Yeah. I, very, I enjoyed very well could be. I enjoyed being on the small council for my brother. I will not be invited to be on the small council for my nephew. So what's the point of me hanging yeah, around here? And in actual fact, yeah. I want out of here. Well, he he had to have known that Cersei hated Robert, and therefore might have. Very negative feelings about Renly by extension as well. So, yeah, yeah. On top of the fact that he was mean to Joffrey in yeah. a way that nobody else was, right? And Cersei seems to be oddly fond of Joffrey. Does she does seem to be fond of him? Ned mentions that the sealing of the will by Robert was witnessed by Grand Maester Pycelle and Renly, but now the reliable one, the one we were counting on last, ep- not yeah, the last. Ned chapter is gone and the other one that's still present we're pretty sure is uh heavily Lannister uh leaning yeah. but of course at the very least if you take the whether or not you take the will as being honest true and you know Robert's last wishes if you simply tear it up in the throne room in front of everyone <laughs> it matters not a jot whether Renly and 20 other people swear that that was what the king asked for Yep, it really doesn't. It really doesn't matter much if she rips it up. She ripped it up and then ripped up the pieces she ripped up. So, yeah. so, uh, so, Barristan Selby reads the will and it 
confirms that Ned should be protector of the realm until the heir comes of age. Yeah, Ned thinks he's, I'm using finger quotes here, playing the game by hiding the detail that the heir is already of age. He's waiting until Ned is fully confirmed and fully has a firm grasp on being regent before uh, dealing with the secession stuff. And for Stannis to get there with his full force, because that's really the key at this point. The key is numbers. Yeah. But if Ned, if this is Ned's version of playing the Game of Thrones, again, with the finger quotes, he's playing checkers while Cersei's playing chess, because... <laughs> I, I, I saw that you put that in the notes, and I, I'd like to countermand, if I will. I don't think... yeah, Yes, to a certain extent, but it's more like he's playing checkers... And she's drawn a gun. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not even playing the same kind of game. It's like a, he, he, brought, he brought a dagger to a gunfight. He, he brought <laughs> a bishop to a gunfight. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the chess scene from Star Wars. It's like, <laughs> let the yeah. Wookiee win. <laughs> let the Wookiee win, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It also it really reminded me um, of the Servardus Egan and Braun duel. Like Littlefinger said, Ned. He said this at the end of the, the last Ned chapter. That Ned is too stiff and restricted by his honor and principles, and he is to win such a fight like this against Cersei and her freewheeling loose morals. He needed to play a little more yeah, uh, yeah. below the line. And I think I think Ned is trying to deal with the whole succession thing. You know, he's he's holding off. He doesn't want to talk about Joffrey's parentage at this juncture. He's trying to right. hold off uh, until he gets the girls out of King's Landing and yes. Stannis into King's Landing. That's the moment he'd like to do all this. He will right. do. He will abide by the letter of the will for now, which is he'll be regent for now. Right. That's... But his hand is going to be forced into moving quicker than that. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly. Well, I guess we'll get we'll get to there when we get to there, but I'm not exactly sure that he still couldn't if he had wanted to play the game a little more at that point. But we did, we got some uh we got some pedantry from a listener named Lewis that that kind of fits into this topic of discussion right here. So um uh, Lewis's pedantry is that if Stannis knew what John Aaron knew, then yes, which 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 we've believed for some time, because when John yes. Aaron was murdered, Stannis fled King's Landing as if he right. was in possession of the same knowledge. You yes, you would think it, it certainly fits. Yeah, but, well, of course, but but let me just before we go any further, just not to undermine yeah. Lewis's pedantry, which is fine. It's good stuff. Um, of course. Stannis might also not have known what John Arry knew, but may have recognized that the murder was because of what John Arry knew, that he was friend and confidant with John Arryn, and therefore that the murderer might also believe that Stannis knew. So even though okay. Stannis didn't necessarily know, so Stannis doesn't necessarily know, he might have fled for the perception that he knows. Yeah, I see what you're saying. But... Yeah. I don't see why John Arryn would keep... The, we know what the secret was now. The secret was the parentage of the prince, right. and, the princes and princess. Why would he keep that from Stannis Baratheon? He wouldn't. And we know that Stannis went with him to the uh, to go see Gendry. And I believe to go... Yeah, to go to, to, go the, to the brothel to, too. Because it seems so out of character for Stannis to be at a brothel. Exactly. So he met Bera as yeah. well as Gendry. So... Yeah, it's very difficult to believe he doesn't know. I'm just, I'm just making right. the point. We don't, we don't know for sure that he knows. But, but yeah, but Lewis's point is right. If he knows, it's incredibly out of character for someone as, as Ned Stark-like as Stannis Baratheon to <laughs> right. not stay his ground and s announce to the world, hey, there's something wrong here, but instead to flee out of there. Right. That is... Yeah. It's... I, 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 the thing is, we don't know Stannis. Stannis has not come up in the book yet at all. Right. So for us now at this point, it's pure conjecture. We've just heard things about Stannis, which does make it very difficult to believe that that's the action he would take. Yeah, yeah. It, it's and we, like... know that, we know that Ned believed that Stannis knew because um, it, was the eight, it was Ned 8 
Uh, just after he quit as uh, Hand of the King, there's a line where he, you know, he's thinking it through, and he had Pycelle send a raven to Dragonstone requesting that Stannis come back to court, come back to King's Landing. And the, the line goes, the silence only deepened his suspicions. Lord Stannis shared the secret that John Aaron had died for. He was certain of it. The truth he sought might very well be waiting for him on the ancient island fortress of House Targaryen. So, he believed that he knew, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Although, speaking of that line, one thing we now know about Pycelle is that um, he certainly heavily favors the Lannister, so it's very possible that he never actually sent that raven. What did the raven say? What did the raven... The raven just asked Stannis to please come back I to, King, to the court because he wanted to talk to him about the things he was yeah, yeah. finding yeah, out. In, in many ways, I mean, Stannis and Ned seem to have similar characters. The, uh-huh. Stannis's behavior here seems to be like Ned discovering what he discovered and then quitting his hand of the king and going back to Winterfell with that knowledge. Right, yeah. Very hard to believe. Very hard to believe that he wouldn't act on that knowledge. Here is one, because I, I, I spent some time thinking about why it might be, and, and uh, here's one possible reason, and I've seen it online as well, is that Stannis not exactly best buds with his brothers Robert and Renly, and so if he made such a claim without John Aaron, once John Aaron died, if he made such a claim like, hey, your kids aren't really your kids, I'm actually the heir, it might look very self-serving. It might look like a, a pretty bad look for Stannis. But then, so, but then what is your play? I mean, again, if we think of him as being like Ned, he doesn't really have a play. Right. But, <laughs> but, but what is your play? You retreat to Dragonstone forever? Yeah, that's a good point. It yeah, feels, he it, couldn't expect Robert to be gored by a boar. Right. It so. feels like what you would do is go around to some of the lords you might think might be sympathetic... And uh-huh. let it slip. Say, look, I can't bring this to Robert's ear now because he and I don't get on well enough for me to bring this to him. John Aaron discovered it, and that's why he was murdered. And that's yeah. how that's how afraid the Lannisters are of this coming out. And start a get, smear campaign is what you're saying. Essentially, start a smear campaign against the Lannisters. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I doubt that's uh, that would definitely be a one way to go. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And plus, I mean, that way you get to swan around the, the kingdom a little bit. You're not confined right. to Dragonstone. Yeah, good point. There's a there's a win-win situation right yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Stannis doesn't sound like he's got the best personality, but even he must be bored on Dragonstone, you know. <laughs> yeah, I definitely see that. <laughs> um, so Ned asked them to confirm him as regent, and they all have seen the will. They all know it's legitimate. Um but who is the small council? It's it's Littlefinger, who yep. by the end of this chapter we know has played Ned. It's yep. Pycelle, who we've already established is a Lannister lackey. It's Varys, who's definitely plotting something. Arya overheard him plotting something, yeah. uh, which sounded like an attempt to bring back the Targaryens. Yeah, and so you know he's not gonna he, he's not gonna jeopardize his spot on the uh, small council where he has this kind of power to back Ned in yes. Ned's claim. He's going to go with the prevailing wind, yeah. Right, yes. Yeah. And Until lastly, it's time not to. Right, exactly. And lastly, Selmy, uh, who is honorable, but he's, his loyalty to the crown will make it very difficult for him to be quick on his feet here. Yeah. In fact, Ned mentions that Selmy's going, it's, Selmy's going to be slow to leave the boy king or something like yeah, that. yeah. But, but before they get a chance to give their loyalty to Ned, which I think all four of them would have given, because why wouldn't you? Right, it's at a, this it, point, yeah. yeah. It's a fait accompli. The king wants this. That's what The king wanted this. That's what we'll do. Yeah, at this point, I think that is what would have definitely happened. But they're interrupted by the king's steward. He says the new yeah. king wants to see you now, and Ned thinks the king's dead, but we'll come along. And this is when he thinks... Uh, that he expected Cersei to to strike quickly, so he's not really surprised, which, once again, goes back to our him flip-flopping on Cersei, because at the very beginning of the chapter, he thought, why hasn't she fled yet? 
and now he's expecting her to have struck struck so quickly. But yeah. so he gets yeah. helped from the Tower of the Hand to the throne room by Littlefinger. He kind of you know he kind of takes him under his arm and helps him along the way. And it, to me, like as I was reading it, I it felt to me like he was like, "Lean on me. I'm your guy. I got you." You know, I'm your I'm your man, and then as we know, what happens at the end of the chapter? Boom! Just totally. he was he was just pickpocketing his dagger at that point. <laughs> That's right. He was loosening the clip on it to make sure the clasp was loose. <laughs> so when they arrive in the throne room, they're they're introduced to Joffrey of Houses Baratheon and Lannister. So this yes. is unusual. Kings don't usually use two names. Um, no, is it there? Uh, are are they just that? Progressive, or is it Lannister <laughs> arrogance? I have a hunch. I know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Not so, only is he announced as that, he's also dressed in Lannister colors and wearing a cape that's decorated with fifty stags and fifty lions. So they're uh, they're definitely showing that he is uh, not yeah. just a Baratheon or any at all. But <laughs> <laughs> Only we know that. <laughs> yeah, they didn't mention on, on his uh, on his cape the the stags are being eaten by the lions. <laughs> 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 All right, so twenty Lannister guards surround the throne. Uh, there's no Baratheon guards around. Yeah, uh, I wondered about that because they never mentioned Baratheon guards. I wondered if either those are the gold cloaks, like would the gold cloaks be considered the Baratheon guards as they're the there to keep the king's peace, or did Renly take them? When he went south, yeah, it's uh, yeah because you'd think that given that Cersei can, can maintain a household retinue of guards, that Robert himself would have something similar. Exactly, that's exactly what I was meaning. Hmm. Yeah, but you could certainly see in this scene you can get a feeling of possibly why Renly left. It's a very Lannister-heavy scene around the Red Keep at the moment. Right, especially when the new Baratheon king is publicly displaying himself as a Lannister, you know. Yes. Right. Which which I, I wonder I wonder from Joffrey's point of view here, when Ned announces what he announces, which to Joffrey must be news, you'd think, mm-hmm. that you are in right. fact the child of your uncle and your mother. I mean you'd think that that would be newsworthy. You, I wonder if you look at all of the gold lions on your cape and <laughs> I wonder that is a lot of lions, you know. Wait a second. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Just saying. So Ned Ned approaches the Iron Throne, and, and while he's doing so, it reminds him of the last time he was in the spot when he rode in at the end of Robert's Rebellion on horseback and forced Jaime off the Iron Throne. And uh, this is a rather different situation this time. Then he had all the numbers and the power. This time he only thinks he has the numbers and the power. Yeah. Yeah. So at yeah, the I mean, moment, he doesn't realize just how different a situation it is. Yeah. So Joffrey wants to be crowned within the fortnight. He wants fealty from the small council now. The Cersei has handed the will and tears it up into little pieces. Uh, she asks him, is this your shield? Piece of paper? And Barristan Selmy, of course, is absolutely mortified that this is happening. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the those, vapors. <laughs> yeah, the, those are the king's words. And she says, and, and not entirely wrongly, well, there's a new king now. It doesn't yeah. matter what the old king wanted. He hasn't been coronated yet, and he is only 12. So, you know, by rule of the past 300 years, except for a few, very, very few exceptions for different reasons... There's always been a regent to rule until the king becomes turned 16. So I think it has more to do with the fact that the Lannisters know they've got the numbers. They've got the men and the swords to do basically whatever they want at this point. A couple of things. One is, he is the king. I mean, prior to his coronation, he is still the king. He's still the king? I think so. Okay. So I don't think she's I don't think she's wrong in saying that. And also I don't think the word coronated is a word. <laughs> Just... <laughs> Coronationated? Is that it? <laughs> Just say. <saying. laughs> um so 
Cersei turns Ned's word back on himself. She's offering him the chance to get out of the bind that he's in now if he bends the knee and he can leave for Winterfell. Which, really, Ned, think about it. Don't just turn that down just on principle. Yeah, he, he turned that down awfully quick. Well, just a, take a minute. A, she should have said, just, just take one more minute. Yeah. <laughs> when, when Littlefinger holds a knife to his throat, he says, can we go back? Like two minutes. <laughs> that thing you said, my my leg it was my leg. My leg is sore. But now it's ready to bend. I was trying. I was <laughs> trying to bend the knee. It wouldn't bend. You got to give me a minute, people. Yeah, you know if if Littlefinger hasn't told Joffrey this news about his parents, which you don't imagine he has, because you know Cersei certainly hasn't go, isn't going to mention it to him, then this may be Ned's last chance to. Scrap this whole plan, wash his hands of it, and head back to Winterfell if Cersei's true to her word. <laughs> well, yeah, but but I mean, she might be. I mean, if he's willing to, if he bends the knee, I mean, it, it's it's more than just a symbol. You are giving your loyalty to him at that point if you bend the knee. Yeah, true. And then if you then go back to Winterfell and announce to the world, oh, he's not the true king, then. That now she might be playing on the Ned Starkness of Ned Stark. Yeah, that's true. It's just that he, she knows, he knows the truth. That's a dangerous thing to just let him walk away. It's a, yeah. it's a bit of a gamble, anyway. Yeah, I mean, well, you, if she, like you say, if she meant it, she might well have just turned the tables anyway and said, yeah, just what, let him say, you know, let him pledge his fealty, bend the knee. Not enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but but because of this, Ned feels that Cersei has forced the issue, and that's when he proclaims, "Your son has no right to sit the throne. Stannis is the true heir." I should have let you say that. You've got the. Uh, the oh, no, no, it's fine. You, that was good. You did well. You did well. <laughs> but but really, what I wanted in my mind, I wanted the camera of the of the book to suddenly flick to Joffrey's face at that point. Right. M- mummy <laughs> what's he talking about <laughs> marcella voices his uh his thought if that's what it was because that's exactly what she she says to cersei what's he talking about i thought joffrey was the new king oh uh, i'd forgotten that I... it was just a little line uh, yeah. there's a lot of action going on here so it's yeah, easy yeah, to yeah. forget such a little line yeah. but you know just like we talked about last ned chapter what exactly is Ned's plan? Like we were saying, there's no DNA testing that can go on here. His proof, his proof is basically a book with a bunch of brunettes and some natural-born children that happen to look a lot like Robert. It's, the smoking gun is Cersei admitting it to him. She's not going to do that in public, so, you know... Yeah, yeah. His, <laughs> his his only play. I mean, obviously, his hand is being forced, but his only play really is to have Stannis come and Stannis to say the same thing. Yeah, what, Stannis all, will always sound self serving. Yeah, exactly. Without yeah. John Aaron to also back it up, then it yeah. just sounds like Stannis being like, "Oh yeah, 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 yeah." What he said. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. exactly right. <laughs> Wait, I'm a, that's a smart I'm, man right there. <laughs> I'm fourth in line to the throne. I'm gonna get rid of those three. Wait a minute, I'm number one. <laughs> Yeah, like we were saying last chapter, his announcement or Stannis' announcement may have swayed some lords, but would it have swayed enough to swing the balance in their favor to get Joff off the throne? Yeah. So that's when, you know, could he have taken the knee, pledged his fealty, waited for Stannis to arrive with his fleet and enough strength to take the throne... It's just Ned was never going to do that, obviously, but may have gotten him out of this jam he got himself into here. Yeah. So Cersei tells Selmy to seize the traitor, Ned. Right. Selmy hesitates because he doesn't know who's right and who's wrong in this situation now. Yeah, that's a tough spot for Selmy because he is a very honorable guy. He wants yeah. to do the right thing. So uh, to, to defend Ned, the Stark men all jump between Selmy and Ned Stark. Um, Meanwhile, Joffrey... Joff is shouting from the throne, "Kill him! Yeah. Kill him!" <laughs> and yeah. uh, obviously, Ned doesn't want this to come to blows, so he asks Anna Slint to intervene at this point, take the royals into custody, do them no harm. 
Yes, and he springs his trap on the Lannisters. Ha ha, I've nice. paid the gold cloaks to do what I say. But you did not know that I, too, am not left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that yeah. Princess Bride. There you go. I've got um, that on my a poster of that on the wall do. right there. You do, yeah, that's true. So, Janus Slint, who gladly accepted the 6,000 gold dragons, calls for the gold cloaks to act, but instead of doing what Ned told them to do, they turn around and attack the Starks, and it starts by what, some gold cloak running a spear through poor Fat Tom, and uh, he drops dead, and then they just start attacking. The Hound gets involved, and, and uh, they just start attacking the Stark men. So we've, we've shouted at Ned at almost every turn not to be so forthright and single-minded in his plans. Um... Yeah, you know, I, yes, we, sure, we certainly have. But I had a, a really uh, cool conversation with a guy, his name was Joel, on a, a Song of Ice and Fire Facebook group about whether uh, it was Ned's decisions that led him to this point or if his fate was sealed the day that Cat convinced him to come south to King's Landing. His argument was that Littlefinger has been playing Ned from the very beginning, basically feeding him info until Ned figured out the the truth of the, the big secret about the the prince and princess's parentage and just let things inevitably play out and give a push when needed. But, but okay, not, not just to interject here, but surely those two things are the same thing. I mean, I mean, it's because of Ned's decisions. I mean, the, the fact that Ned's decisions are so predictable plays into Littlefinger's hands, but Ned yeah. is still making the decisions. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. They, uh, I think, yeah, right. If if Joel's theory is correct, then Ned just kept making uh, Littlefinger's job easier and easier. <laughs> he just kept doing the things he was expected to do. But we we can assume ah, I mean we don't have a hundred percent fact that Littlefinger knew, but we can. It's a pretty big secret. We know Varys knew because he mentions he and uh, Illyrio Mopatis have Potis. a chat about it. So we could feel fairly certain that uh, Littlefinger also knew. So, so yeah, you're so right. So what, what, what you're saying is, if Littlefinger was truly on Ned's side, he could have just told him. Could have said from the yeah, get-go. Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, yeah, the, yeah. The, the thing that John Aaron died for, brace yourself, is yeah. Yeah. Joff- I mean, Joffrey is Jamie's bastard. Right. Yeah, he could have. But, but he also knew that Ned was super principled, unyielding, honorable, and was just going to keep reacting in that way to everything that came up. And, you know, there were times when Littlefinger would mention other plans, like, like just last chapter when he suggested, you know, the whole plan about letting Joffrey, uh, you know, be his regent. And then if he's problematic, we can take Stannis out and we can reveal the secret then and put Renly on the throne. He could make those kind of suggestions because he knows Ned's not going to take him up on them. And even if he did, the plan he offered last last chapter, he comes out pretty well in the end of that uh, plan yeah, as well. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, I you're you're right. I mean, I think I think Littlefinger is pretty flexible. You know what I mean? I don't think yeah. he's got any principles in favor of anybody involved, apart right. from himself. And so he can keep throwing out ideas, and whichever one sticks is the one he'll go with. He's only going to throw out ideas that benefit himself, and he's going to make sure that he's on the winning side, no matter which, yeah. no matter what. Yeah. And and that's one thing that Ned's decisions certainly did. Ned's decisions more and more weakened his own hand to the point where the people who were fair weather friends were going to abandon him absolutely yeah yeah even if ned hadn't told cersei what he knew because that's you know we spent a whole lot of time in that chapter talking about why why right now why give her so much lead up time to plan and scheme little if Littlefinger knew and he wanted things to work out a certain way he could have just you know let her know on the down low that Ned, Ned was, knows the secret. Yeah, right. N- yeah Ned's yeah, hot yeah. on the trail of the secret. So, um, 
Yeah. You know? So the, this that's why I'll give Littlefinger a break here. I will say that Littlefinger wanted to work with Ned and wanted Ned to, you know, win this. Huh. On some levels, but. Ned just kept blowing it at every opportunity to the point where Littlefinger went, right, you're on your own. Yeah, that's one way. I, I, had, I had never really thought about Littlefinger being on Ned's side. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I think he tried to be. I mean, but like you said, if he really thought it through, perhaps he always knew deep down that Ned was never going to do the dishonorable, smart thing. Yeah. To me, it always felt like Littlefinger was trying to create chaos to serve him uh, in the end. He was just trying to throw as much tension because there's no reason for him to lie about the dagger belonging to Tyrion that was, it appears to solely be about creating tension between the Lannisters and the Starks. And, you know, it felt like he was intentionally trying to create a, create tension between the two families. But... Was he trying to do that? Yeah, I agree. He was trying to bring this to a to a boil, but right. I think he was on the Stark side. Huh. I, I think he flipped sides at yeah. the eleventh hour. I was thinking maybe that, aside from trying to create this tension to give him a chance to rise in power, that maybe he was exactly opposite of what you said. Maybe he was. Um, working against the Starks to try to bring them down. And the only reason I could really think of is due to the duel from the duel with Brandon from when he was a boy, you know? Right. Right. And of course, that's definitely a possible motivation. If he's still in love with Cat Stark, he might want Ned to get it, you know, and yeah. then swoop in. Definitely. And possible. at the same time, it's punishing Brand the, the Stark family who's, you know, Brandon right. Stark embarrassed him and um, got him basically banished from River Run. So, yeah, it's a little finger makes things awfully interesting. That's for sure. Yeah, one yeah. way or the other. Yeah, definitely. But uh, he makes things really interesting at the very end of this chapter, when during all this chaos, was was mentioned in the summary, uh, he slips Ned's dagger out of the sheath and puts it under Ned's chin and says. I did warn you not to trust me. And when I read that part, I wondered if Ned thought at the very beginning, it's like the first paragraph of this chapter, he refers to Cersei as she's a greater fool than I imagined when he's wondering if the display down in the yard is, is being done on his behalf. And I wondered if he thought, huh, and I just called her a fool about <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. a few hours ago. Look she who was the probably, fool is now. <laughs> she was probably thinking, he's a greater fool than I imagined. <laughs> yeah. all right give us some background okay so i wanted to do a, a eulogy for our dear fat tom as i did for our dear jury can i interject here i think it's slightly funny that in the chapter in which king robert baratheon first of his name passed away from this mortal coil you're eulogizing fat tom <laughs> i'm saving a eulogy for Robert for a later date. <laughs> okay. You, you think there's more to it? He's going to go north of the wall and come back to Yeah, us. that's right. So here we go with the uh, Fat Tom eulogy. Tom Ard, a.k.a. Fat Tom, was a member of the Stark Household Guard. He was a sweet, loyal, affable man of 50-ish. It was Tom who gave Arya the nickname Arya Underfoot. It was also Tom whose legs Arya slid through during one of her many times she ran from Septim Ordain. He had ginger whiskers and possibly Swiss cheese for brains, as he was easily tricked, like when he knocked on Arya's door and she shouted that she wasn't in there, which he bought. <laughs> Tom rose to captain of the Stark household guard after Alan went with Beric Dondarrion to track down the mountain. In his last days, Tom was excited to get back to Winterfell, as he missed his wife after Ned told him he was to accompany the Stark girls on their sea voyage. He is survived by said wife and a son named Tom Two, who I'm sure he was also excited to see. Presumably. Rest in peace, Fat Tom. Farewell. Tell Jory we said hello. Yes. So comparison with the television show, it's very much the same. The early scene where the girls at breakfast is dropped 
But later on in the show, we do see Arya at her dancing lesson, and we see Ned, uh, we see Sansa complaining about Arya being at her dancing lesson. But that's all after okay. the events yeah. of this chapter. Uh, the scene with the small council is dropped. Instead, Ned bumps into Littlefinger and Varys on his way to the throne room, having been summoned by the king's steward. Oh, and so okay. their conversation is very hurried and held outside the throne room. When they go into the throne room, he hands the unbroken sealed will to Barristan Selmy, who confirms that it's the king's seal, breaks it and hands it to Cersei, who promptly tears it up. So, <laughs> so that part <laughs> remained the same. <laughs> so it's it's only from Littlefinger and Varys on the way in that he learns of Renly's absconsion from King's Landing as well. Okay. Um, Barrison's confused and troubled just as he is in the book and everything else goes down exactly as in the book. All right. Good so stuff. pedantry, um, um, we'll thank Lewis for providing that pedantry. I, I, I agree. I think it's, it's a difficult one because, because I try to focus pedantry on more pedantic things than sure. the choices that major characters make because that's a yeah. decision of the writing. But in this, you, you've written Stannis in a certain way and now you're having him behave in a way that doesn't match that. It does feel a little bit uh, sure, yeah, s- skewed. Yeah. So thank you, Lewis, for that. Yes, thank you, Lewis. So news and notes. Yeah. Um, so we haven't yet recorded the. This is the fiftieth episode. We're going to do an, a midweek special for our fiftieth. Um, yeah. So keep an should, eye out. Be sure yeah, should, to check it out. Probably Wednesday. I would. I would guess. Yeah. It's not recorded yet, so <laughs> maybe Thursday. <laughs> so speaking of Lewis, Lewis is like our guest star of this episode. Uh, we got a really great email from Lewis. You especially had a really nice exchange with him. Um, but he said that he had tried a bunch of A Song of Ice and Fire podcasts, but couldn't really get into any until he found us. woo <laughs> And... Uh, he said he loves the structure and the uh, depth of the analysis that we provide, and uh, we help we helped keep him entertained while uh, moving houses. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah. He did mention that he appreciates the difficulty we face when theorizing about different aspects um, with a book that we already know the answers to yeah. without giving away uh, any spoilers. And to be fair, that's much more difficult for you because you do remember the stuff. <laughs> I don't have to fake it, really. I'm like, I actually don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> it's all lost. Yeah, there's, there's things in this particular episode alone that I know I'm theorizing, and I do know the answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> but he also said he likes how our background info gives a more complete picture of the Westeros Essos world. So yes, thanks. It was awesome. Thank you, yeah, Lewis. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, oh, one more thing before we hit the conclusion. Um, George Martin has been tweeting out random audiobook chapters for free. So Of A Song of Ice uh, and Fire? Yeah. So you, you, if you are reading along with us or, or letting us take you through this, you might want to hold off on those. But for others who already know how the story goes, check out his Twitter feed and you can uh, get some free audiobook chapters. All right, so a conclusion. Now we can yeah, conclude. Let's do it. <laughs> so one thing that Littlefinger was truly always honest about was not to trust him. He was. <laughs> That's right. That is definitely true. Uh, it's just weird that Ned, who hadn't fully trusted him to this point, put everything on the line based on Littlefinger's word. That. That's a lot. Yeah. That's but, a lot of trust. But you know what I mean? He was going to put everything on the line anyway. Yeah, but at least if he had looked Jaina Slint in the eyes, he might have been able to get a feel for yeah, whether he was the true. kind of guy that you could put this much faith in. Like, everything. All of the marbles were in this plan. Yeah. He turned down Renly's hundred swords. They put them all in this gold cloaks plan. And did not work out at all. I wonder if Ned should have counteracted Renly's offer by saying... Give me your hundred swords and we'll get your brother on the throne. That's who should be. I know you don't want it. I know you think you're better than him. But better your brother than Joffrey. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I I wonder if he's thinking that right now. Like, I should (laughs) have. That was a better idea. (laughs) 
Well, it's taken me like eight years to think of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair to Ned. <laughs> Well, it seems like Joffrey slash Cersei are not playing by the whole regent rules. <laughs> so, yeah, but I wonder if there had been a stronger small council, if they weren't all flatterers and fools, if they could have squashed this in any way. Because the, he is too young. He's, he's not is, 16. Though, I actually think that this is not a bad small council. I mean, Pycelle is on the payroll, so he doesn't really count. But Littlefinger and Varys are both both schemers with their own agendas, but they're not just flatterers and fools. Yeah. They're willing yeah, to they're be. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, they're more than that, exactly. Yeah, but they're they're also not... It, neither of them are looking out for the best interest of the king. They're both looking out for the best interest either of themselves or of some other agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which makes them... Inherently not so great small council members. Right. And and Barristan Selmy is is a bit of a failure as a small council member because of his sort of honour. You know, he's so honourable that a defter King's Guard might be right. able to have brought something useful to the party. Yeah. He really didn't really didn't help a whole lot. Pretty much any way. Which which it's <laughs> difficult for the Lord Commander of the King's Guard to help in a situation where there's a con you know conflict yeah, over who uh, right. you know takes the throne that's difficult i get it yeah and you could see you could definitely see why he hesitated when cersei said seize the traitor yeah. because the king's word that he just read said oh, ned should be the king regent which you know, means he should be supporting ned and at the same time the little boy on the throne who is now the king and his mom are saying arrest this man so but she did offer, um, Cersei offered Ned a knee and a trip back to Winterfell, which is a pretty nice offer. I mean, you know, I don't know how legit it was, but it's a pretty good offer. Yeah. I really wish he had uh, considered it a little more. Yeah. So, so Ned's note was to Stannis was with Tom. And so that is not now going to Dragonstone, as far as we can tell. Which is, I just realized that's a difference from the book because the guy he gives the note to, sorry, a difference with the TV show. In the TV show, he gives the note to someone who isn't in the throne room. Okay. So that yeah. note, that note is free. Now, that person w- was supposed to be going with the girls to the boat at noon that day, and that doubtful that that's happening now. But the note was free in the TV show, so that is a slight difference I haven't thought of. Yeah, right. But here in our book, if Stannis didn't know, and we do believe that we do think he did know, but if he didn't know then he might never know yeah. because the uh, last person who ever might tell him <laughs> right. is in a bit of a pickle here. Yes, yes. And certainly has no way to uh, access ravens or... Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Unless someone can smuggle one into his jail cell, you know. Like you never know. Maybe phones. Cersei's just going to have him returned back to the Tower of the Hand unharmed. Yes, that'll be it. Like, that, like that, he was going to do with her. That's right, that's it. That's what we're going to So is it for. Ned's decisions that landed him here, or was he uh, led by carefully placed breadcrumbs by uh, Littlefinger? I've, I personally feel like it's his decisions. Like That's my personal opinion. I think there are several opportunities that he had so far in this book that would have led to different outcomes. Obviously, if he had taken Renly up on his offer, it might have led to a different outcome. Yeah. I think... I, I agree. I think it's I think it's Ned's own decisions. And I, I and I think what Breadcrumb's little finger put in front of him weren't necessarily intended to be to Ned's detriment. They were what Ned wanted. Ned wanted to get to the bottom of that secret. And little yeah. finger You know, one that just came to my mind right now that was very conveniently timed was the brothel re- revelation. Littlefinger coming to Ned just after he threw down his hand of the king badge and on the desk in front of Robert and stormed out and was planning on heading back to Winterfell, which Littlefinger witnessed, he then, oh, all of a sudden, magically has found the brothel, which prevents Ned from getting on the boat and heading back to Winterfell, staying in King's Landing and continuing down the path. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Yeah. That does... Just hit me right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. That does feel like that's a, that's a point at which Littlefinger intervened to keep this confrontation going a bit longer yeah so 
maybe as a mixture of both. Ned's decisions definitely heavily orchestrated uh, this outcome, but maybe with some nudging and yeah, some yeah. conjoling of Littlefinger. So what now? Uh, Ned's in a lot of trouble. The flatterers and fools don't seem like they're going to uh, stand up to Joffrey. No. That's not their MO, uh, no. any of them. No. And Varys is still the wild card, though. Yes, yes, whatever his mm. uh, goal is. Yeah, you know, his his goal at this point still is very vague, so well, it'll be, it'll be curious to follow and, and keep an eye on how this upheaval here affects his plan. Has, has he voiced any um, motives? Has he said why, you know, what, what is his loyalty? I mean, we've inferred no, no. little fingers, but... Yeah, uh, uh, not that I can recall. I mean, basically, we got his inner workings, or at least through Arya. what we perceive to be his inner workings, when Arya was spying on him and Illyrio, and basically it was just a back and forth about the realm. Illyrio wanted Varys to stall the uh, what he was perceiving as a war coming soon. He wanted him to stall it. It was too soon. And Varys said, stall, I say to you, speed up your side of the deal. Yeah. So, so from that, one would infer that he is a Targaryen loyalist more than anything else. You would think. Yeah, it certainly... Uh, mm certainly comes across that way but because i believe if, I, if i'm not mistaken in that same conversation illyrio mentions that i think i don't remember if he particularly calls out the targaryens or says they are heading to vase dothrock like so there's time you gotta yeah yeah we're not ready yet she's going in the wrong direction but when i mean varus was charged with sending the assassins to kill the targaryens yep. and when Robert was injured. Ned told Varys to bring those assassins back. Varys didn't say, "Yeah, sure, that won't be any trouble because I never sent them." Yeah, he said, "Those birds have already flown. I'm not sure I could stop them." Yeah, and he's also the one that told Robert that she was married and that she was pregnant. Two things that would lead to him wanting her dead. Wanting her dead. So yeah. yeah. It's hard to know. It's very, hard to know what Barry It's is very, yeah. yeah, very vague and complicated, yeah. I guess. All right, we better stop. People have got lives to All get right. back to. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Fortunately, we don't. We're just going to continue <laughs> to talk about this once we turn the mics off. <laughs> As always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harren Hall, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And please go right now. And hit us with a five-star review, if you wouldn't mind. We need your help to keep us growing and reaching new ears. We're not afraid to toot our own horns, but it will be a lot more impactful if it comes from you lot. So I really wish you wouldn't mind going out and doing that. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.